How many of you have uh, ever watched the Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Raise your hand. If you have not, you need to repent of that sin, and you need to get your family with you, and you need to make that a yearly thing. Now, there's two reasons you need to watch that. Number one, it shows you the value of life, and number two, it shows you how much better people were on screen back then than they are now, all right? So make sure of that. But you know, when you think about It's a Wonderful Life, the movie is about a man by the name of George Bailey who takes over his dad's mortgage business and he's $8,000 short at the end of the year. He goes begging to the most evil man in the city. Watch the clip with me. I need help. Through some sort of an accident, my company shortened their accounts. The bank examiner got there today. I've got to raise $8,000 immediately. Oh, that's what the reporters wanted to talk to you about. The reporters? Yes, they called me up today from your building and loan. Oh, there's a man over there from the DA's office, too, who's looking for you. Please help me, Mr. Potter. Help me, won't you, please? Can't you see what it means to my family? I'll pay any sort of a bonus on the loan, any interest. If you still want the building and loan, I'm... George, I'm... could it possibly be there's a slight discrepancy in the books? No, sir, there's nothing wrong with the books. I've just misplaced $8,000. I can't find it anywhere. You misplaced $8,000? Yes, sir. Well, I'll have you notified the police? No, sir, I, I didn't want the publicity. Harry's homecoming tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you're going to believe that one. <laughs> What have you been doing, George? Um, playing the market with the company's money? No, sir. No, sir, I haven't. What oh, is it? A woman, then? Uh, you know, it's all over town that you've been giving money to Violet Bick. What? <laughs> Not that it makes any difference to me, but why did you come to me? Why don't you go to Sam Wainwright and ask him for the money? I can't get a hold of him. He's in Europe. Well, what about all your other friends? Well, they don't have that kind of money, Mr. Potter. You know that. You're the only one in town that can help me. <laughs> Here, boy. I've suddenly become quite important. <laughs> well, what kind of security would I have, George? You got any stocks? No, sir. Bonds? Real estate? Collateral of any kind? I have some life insurance. $15,000 policy. Yes. Uh, how much is your equity in it? $500. $500? And you asked me to lend you $8,000. Look at you. You used to be so cocky. You were going to go out and conquer the world. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. What are you but a warped, frustrated young man? Miserable little clerk crawling in here on your hands and knees and begging for help. No securities, no stocks, no bonds, nothing but a miserable little $500 equity and a life insurance policy. <laughs> You're worth more dead than alive. Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so much and ask them to let you have 8000 You know why? Because they run you out of town on a rail. But I tell you what I'm going to do for you, George, since the uh, state examiner is still here. As a stockholder of the building and loan, I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Misappropriation of funds, manipulation, malfeasance. All right, George. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can't hide in a little town like this. <laughs> yeah, Bill, this is Potter. Oh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Glad you come. Glad you come. How about some of that good spaghetti? We got everything. God. Oh, God. Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but you're up there and you can hear me. Show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. I... Show me the way. Oh, God. 
Well, the movie does really end well. And for you who don't know this, that little thing on the desk that he was dialing, that was called a telephone. That's what that is. But when you look at back at 2020, would you really say it was a wonderful year? I mean, think about it. A tornado, COVID, sickness, death, unemployment, virtual school. Does that really sound like a wonderful life. Is there a way that we can move our hearts and our minds from uncertainty to a place called home? And to move our hearts toward home, what does that really even mean? Because a lot of you, if you got honest, you'd say, you know what, with my background and my past from about my home, that's the last thing, that's the last place I want to go back to because the memories are not good. And yet, I think if we got honest, we would say that we want home to be a place where we long to be. Because we want home to be a place of acceptance and where uncertainty, but the problem is is that uncertainty, the uncertainty of life clouds our vision and we don't understand the goodness of coming home. But when you think about Christmas, it usually is always about coming home. So how does my heart come home? How do I reset my life during the holiday season and hopefully it takes me through 2021? There's a couple that demonstrates this concept about coming home because they both understand the principle of acceptance. And they would not have been two people that major corporations would have lined up to see their resume to hire. Matter of fact, they were on from the other side of the tracks. But the moment that God speaks to them about the birth of a child, they understand acceptance. And as they understand acceptance, they still have to deal with all of the uncertainties. And as we move through this story, I'm going to give us two points of uncertainty and I'm going to give us two points of application. And I think as you move through the story, you're going to be really surprised how much this story And the principles of it deal with what we're dealing with right now. So let me encourage you to take some notes here, okay? And uh, even if you're a man, yes, get something out to write on. You will learn more. You'll remember more if you write it down. So here's the first uncertainty is a lack of fanfare. We have this crazy notion in our life that we cannot be satisfied unless we're having some kind of emotional high. And we want fanfare with all of our activities and where our emotions are fed. No matter where we are, our emotions really dictate the day for us. So if life is good, our emotions are up and we say it was a good day. But if our emotions are down because it's a bad day, we usually are saying to people around us, well, it was a bad day. The nation of Israel was the same way. They took pride in the fact that Israel was God's chosen nation. But yet what happened to them was that they didn't choose just to worship Jehovah God. They were a lot like us. They had their other idols in their life that they tried to worship along with Jehovah God. But because they served other gods, it comes to a point that God's allowing nations to come against them and to rule over them. And once the last prophet, Malachi, and that's where we're gonna be in just a moment, but Once Malachi speaks, there are 400 years of silence. They don't hear anything. And can you imagine Israel being decimated by the enemy? The prophet Malachi shows up and says, I know things don't look good right now, but I want you to know that the Messiah is coming and the Messiah did come, but it was 400 years later. So Malachi chapter 4 Starting with verse 1, we're going to read this, but we're really going to camp out in Luke chapter 1. So this is sort of, we're going to set the stage here in Malachi chapter 4. So would you stand with me as we read in honor of the Word of God? It says, for behold, the day is coming, burning light. Now, this right here, this verse in Malachi, I'm reading from the Amplified Version. The rest of it will be from the New International Version. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant, proud, self-righteous, haughty, 
and every evildoer shall be stubble, and the day that is coming shall set them on fire, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. So let me tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about all those nations that are coming against Israel. And he says, eventually God's gonna have their way and he's gonna come back and bring vengeance on them because of what they did to God's people. And he says, you're not gonna have a root or branch. In other words, you're not gonna have any foundation in your life. They're not gonna have any foundation in their life at all. Now we go to verse two. He says, but for you who fear my name with all filled reverence, the son of righteousness. Let's stop right there. The son of righteousness. Who's he talking about? Well, he prophesies about two people that are going to come. Number one, he prophesies about John the Baptist who's coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. Then he speaks of this son of righteousness who is Jesus himself. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forward and leap joyfully like calves released from the stall. Now, when you see this, so there's a lot of uncertainty with the nation of Israel here. And then somebody comes along and they say, somebody that they really trust because they were trusting these prophets that heard from God. So you think about it. When somebody comes to you and they look at you in a time of uncertainty, and it's somebody you really trust, and they say to you, hey, I, I know what's happening, and let me just, I got a word for you. And you really trust them. And it's going to happen. And then you look at them and what's the first question you ask? When? Right? When is that going to happen? That's what we all ask. Okay, I believe that God's going to come through, but when? And have you ever noticed that God usually comes through when we have no idea when he's going to come through? And he doesn't usually come through as quickly as we want him to come through. And he usually doesn't even come through the way we want to. So they tell Israel, I'm telling you, the Messiah is coming. Somebody's coming to rescue us. The promised one, he's coming. When? They don't know when. 400 years later. Right, Merry Christmas to you, right? It's going to happen. So when you think about that, you think about what the nation of Israel is, is, is looking for. You see, there's a lack of fanfare for the nation of Israel here. What is it that makes Christmas so great? Is that you know when it's coming, right? It happens every year on December the 25th. You know that it is coming. So here's a question. Will, will we allow God to move us through all of our uncertainties. Let's pray together. God, would you bless your word? And oh God, I pray that we would bring our hearts in accordance to the will of the word of God. We love you. Thanks for today in Jesus name. And everybody says, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So when we look at this, I think it's sort of like and we look at this and we think, okay, hope is coming. I know that God is going to come through. But I think because of 2020, we're sad and we're disheartened. So the first uncertainty is a lack of fanfare. Now, I'm fixing to move to the second uncertainty, but let me just tell you. I know you're thinking right now, well, that first uncertainty was pretty quick. The second uncertainty is not as quick, all right? So I need you to buckle in, settle up, and let me just tell you, it's not going to be like what you got with Lance Brown last week when he preached a 23-minute sermon. I'm in Cancun and I'm watching it and I'm going, oh, don't do this. Don't do this. Because now these jokers are going to expect a 23-minute sermon. I can't say my name in 23 minutes, all right? So I'm just, it's not going to be that quick. So the first uncertainty is a lack of fanfare. Here's the second uncertainty, is a crisis of belief. I think we would all say there's been a lot of first in 2020. Unexpected sickness, unexpected deaths. School shut down, athletic events canceled, restaurants closed, entertainment industry shut down, birthday parties redone. Let's look at some firsts in Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Matter of fact, there are four firsts that I'm going to draw your attention to, all right? So here we go. Starting in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. To a virgin place to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now that phrase, the Lord is with you, that's the first. That's the first time in all of scripture that this phrase is said 
to a woman that the Lord is with you. Let's look at the next verse, verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Now, the next verse is that right there. You have found favor with God. So the next verse is, it's the first time this term is used to a woman in all of Scripture. That she had found faith, they had found favor with God. The first time in all Scripture that this is said to a woman. In verse 31, it says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him what? Say it again. A little louder. Say it again. Jesus. Jesus. Well, there's just something about that name in there. You are to give him the name Jesus. Here's the third first. Is that it is the first proclamation of the Savior's personal name. Go, go to verse 32 through verse 34. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? I think we all can understand here the fourth verse. What are the chances of a woman getting pregnant without the aid of a man? Zero percent. I think we're all smart enough to understand that, right? So here's a first. And then verse 30, and when, when she says, she says, since I am a virgin, it is better rendered in the language in other translations when it says that I know not a man. Now, what she's saying is, I know not a man. She said, I, I don't know any man. I've never been sexually active with anybody before Joseph, and I'm sure haven't been sexually active with Joseph. I know not a man. So we go on and we look at scripture and it says in verse 35, it says this. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age, in her old age, and she was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Let's go back to verse 37 here. When it says in verse 37, it says, for no word from God. Now, when that is said right there, from no word of God, let me tell you what that is. That is an absolute negative in the text. In other words, it, in other translation, it's rendered for nothing with God is impossible. It is the same phrase that is, that is used over in Genesis 18 when Abraham is almost 100 years old and God says to him, I told you that I was going to bless you and I was going to bless all the nations through you and I'm going to give you your son. Now, it's pretty difficult for a 100-year-old man by the name of Abraham to produce a child. I mean, the dude can't even get out of bed, right? He's 100. 100 years old and he is going to be he, he is going to be with his wife, Sarah. She's going to give birth to a son that eventually, and, and his name is going to be Isaac. Well, when he goes to God and he goes, how can this be? And he says, he says, with God, nothing is impossible. It is exactly the same word for no word from God will ever fail. So today, when you're here today, the uncertainties of life God is saying to you, hey, I promise you that I'm going to come through. All you need to do is trust me and to move your heart toward me, toward home, so that I can not only speak to you, but so that I can use you, but I am going to come through for you. And then let's go back to verse 38. Here's a phrase I want you to see. It says, may your word to me be fulfilled. Now, I want you to just think for a moment. Where is it that right now, you, if you got really honest, you'd say, I'm not sure that God could really come through for me on that one. Where is it that you would say what, I find myself praying a lot, God, give me faith to believe. You have to understand this. For Mary, she took God at her word, but you also have to understand that at this point, Mary is living in total submission because she wants to honor God. Let's go back to verse 29. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, when it says to her, it says, greatly troubled. Let me tell you how that's rendered in the language. It means that she is stirred up throughout. That means every ounce of her was emotional. Every ounce of her was stirred up. Every ounce of her was emotional. Have you ever been around a lady that you could say, oh my goodness, every ounce of emotion is stirred up within her. If you run into that lady, don't try to reason. As a matter of fact, if you try to reason with, you, with her, it would be better, men, for you to wrestle with a bear or an alligator than it would to try to reason with that lady. And let me tell you, the worst thing you can say to that lady that is stirred up throughout and stirred up, the worst thing you can ever say, Eric, are you listening to me? You got me? The worst thing you can say is, calm down. Oh, don't say that. I'm going to tell you, you would rather be wrestling with a bear at the time than to look at a woman and say, oh, calm down. My wife is sitting over here, and she is a mild individual, but there are those days where she is stirred up. I have learned you need to back away quickly and just let God deal with her, right? All right? So, so when you think about this, if she was stirred up. I mean, you think about this. Mary's probably on her way to Jerusalem High School, and an angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, you wonder why she's stirred up? By the way, you're pregnant. I know not a man. How can I be pregnant? By the Holy Spirit. Oh, ladies, try that one on for size. You think about that. No wonder she was stirred up. 2020 have been a first for everybody, and we struggle with the uncertainties because this lack of fanfare and this crisis of belief. So how does my heart come home in times of uncertainty? You know why we struggle so much with COVID? Sure, it's, it's, it has caused great harm and people have passed away, but if we don't have a loved one or a friend or somebody we know about that's passed away, you know why we struggle with COVID? Because it's taken us away from normal. I want you to know that the God that you serve, the Jesus that lives in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit, he is everything but normal. And what do we want? We keep crying out, God, I want normal. Have you ever thought that God doesn't want normal for you? But that's the thing that we want is normal all the time. We want We want normal for every part of our life. And when God takes us away from normal, we don't know how to act because of the uncertainty. So let me give you the first application. We're accepted because of position. How many times during the week do we feel like, if we really got honest, we'd say, oh my goodness, I just don't feel worthy. And there's thoughts that we can't move away from that our mind continues to hang on to, our heart continues to hang on to. What is happening that in our surroundings, our surroundings make us feel uncertain and that there's no hope. And we forget that our acceptance has nothing to do with us, but everything, every, but everything has to do with God in our lives. We think it's all about us, and it's not about us. It's about what God wants to do in our life. And so I want to give you this thought here. It's going to be on the screen here, okay? That accepted because of grace in the moment. So Luke chapter 1, verse 28. You want to see grace in the moment? It says this, that the angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored. Hang on to that. If you got your Bible, underline highly favored. The Lord is with you. Go to verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Both times he mentions the word favor. You know what that means? It's not talking about highly favored for nine months from now when you're going to give birth to Messiah. He's speaking of highly favored in the moment. Right now in the moment, you're accepted because of God's call on your your life. And there are people that will tell you that, oh, well, Mary, she had all this thing. She, I mean, she was more holy than everybody else. No, she was not. 
She was accepted and put in the position that she was because of God's sovereignty and because of grace of the grace of God in the moment. And God knew that he could trust Mary. You see, here's what we need to understand. Is that right now, that we look back at that day, God picked her because of the sovereignty of God. And that God could trust her. And you think about that. You know, uh, uh, about a month ago, I ran into a man that as we began to converse, uh, we, he began to ask about where I was from and if I played athletics, told him where I played. And eventually he asked me, he, and I told him, I said, well, my dad coached football. And he said, who's your dad? And I told him my dad's name. And he said, your dad's Ted Wilson? I said, he is. And he goes, he's the greatest man I've ever met. He said, the thing I remember about your dad is how your dad laughed with everybody. He laughed with the people that competed with him and beat him. The few times they beat him, he laughed with the people that he beat. He laughed with the person that was 0-10. He laughed with the coach that was 5-5. Five and five. He laughed with the coach that was 10-0 and, and, and won the state championships. Your dad laughed with everybody. And yes, I have incredible parents and I am a blessed man because I had great parents. But you know the thing about my parents is that one day my parents are going to die. And even though that I'll look back and say, Ted and Pat Wilson, they were my parents. I got news for you that no matter who you are a child of, you are a child of the king of the ages because God saw something in you that you would have never seen in yourself. Can I get an amen on that one? Because right now some of you are thinking, I, you know what, I, I just can't believe that I could do this. Why would God call me to this? Because God saw something in you that you would never see in yourself. And you can face the uncertain times because of the certainty of God that God accepts you for the moment. I mean, right now. Not, and it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you've done months ago or years ago. God accepts you in the moment, right now in this moment. So we are accepted because of the grace in the moment. But the second thing is, is that we are equipped because of grace for the future. And you see, we can't even get our heads around about being accepted because of grace in the moment because we're worried about the future. Well, here's the good part, that we are equipped, and he, the Spirit of God is equipping us for grace for the future. You see, whatever it is that's coming our way, that's in the future, God already has a plan already in place for the future, for the next uncertainty, for the next crisis of unbelief in our life. Look what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power, circle that word power, if you can do that. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I mean, you think about Mary, she's gonna be the mother of Jesus, right? Really, she is already the mother of Jesus. And it says, can I go back to that verse, with guys? The power of the Most High. Why is that word power so important? Because the exact same word is used in Acts 1.8. Jesus has died. He's risen from the dead. And before he ascends to the Father, there's a 40-day period that he teaches to the disciples of nothing except the kingdom of God. And in Acts 1 8, this is what it says. You will receive what? When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, here's what you've got to remember the Holy Spirit doesn't come in you, don't miss this, just to be a fixture in your house. Did you get that? He doesn't come to be a fixture in your house. Now, here's some pictures of some Christmas trees here, all right? They're just pictures of Christmas trees. Now, let me just tell you about all those Christmas trees, all right? There's one thing about them, all right? They're all real. None of them are artificial. They're all real. Now, when you look at those Christmas trees, let me just tell you, all those Christmas trees is that they begin to shed pine needles, and somebody's got to sweep them up 
and get them off the carpet, off your hardwoods. Somebody's got to do that because that's just a natural process. Now, if we would have known what 2020 was going to hold, most of us would have just left our Christmas tree up in 19 and just left it up all year long. But eventually, can I tell you, those Christmas trees are going to die off because it is nothing more than a fixture in your house. Now, before I move on, I need to say a word to some of you here this morning. Some of you are living in complete sin because you got them artificial trees in your house, all right? They're, it's just a complete sin, all right? Now, if you've got allergies, okay, God gives you a pass. But for the rest of you who just take those crazy artificial trees and you decorate them and you just pick them up and put them in your attic and you bring them back out and you don't ever decorate them, that is straight up sin in the name of Jesus. You need to repent of that, all right? It's too late to buy a new tree. God shows grace in the moment for you, but for the future, can we just get on the same page, please, and get a stupid living Christmas tree in your house? Can I get some amens from somebody? Amen. Oh, my goodness. That person right down here that just said amen is because you have a lot of Christmas tree, right? Can we just, it, just for a moment, pray for this child, all right? I mean, you think about this poor child right here. Let me give you a better example here, all right? She's sitting on the third row right here, all right? Her name is Daria Hopper. She's not mine anymore. She's married to this man right here, okay? So she comes home the first year from college, and she starts telling us. She's going, you've got to be kidding me. You've got an artificial tree. She goes crazy talking to us about that. So you know what we did? We were so glad she was home. We took the tree down, did we not? Shaw, shaw. And we put up a new tree, a real tree. She gets married and have kids. Guess what she does? She lives in sin. That's what she does. And she just has that tree, an artificial tree. You know what? It takes too much work. She forgets that we raised our kids and she was one of them. It was a lot of work. So you know what all her kids, you know what her two kids do? They come over and they help Paul and Shasha decorate our tree. We've never had so many decorations on the lower limbs in all of our life. <laughs> That's exactly what some of you do with the Holy Spirit. He has simply become a fixture in your life. And that's all it is. And you put him away in the attic when you don't need him. I got news for you. The Holy Spirit is not like a Christmas tree. He's not a fixture in your house. He comes in your life. He invades in your life. And he is the chief operating officer in your life. But we treat him just like a fixture. The Holy Spirit has given power. So the first application, we're accepted because of position. The second application, accepted because of responsibility. Now, I know right now you're going, hold on, wait a minute. You're talking about work salvation. No, no, I'm not. I'm talking that she accepted responsibility because the Holy Spirit of God rested on her. In John 15, when Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit from apart from me. You can do nothing. In John 15, it talks about three different fruit. It talks about fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Because we are in Christ and the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us, there is a responsibility to bear fruit because, let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you, you can't help but bear fruit. Luke 1.38, it says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the, don't miss this, then the angel left her. Now, guys, keep, this keep that text up for me for just a moment here. You see, there is a legitimacy in the subject. If there's not, then Mary can be a servant to anyone. There is legitimate power in the Lord. The responsibility, it might be difficult, and oh, it is difficult, but it is necessary. Then the angel left her. You know why the angel left her? Everything been said. She was ready to go. She was going to obey God in the moment. You see, 
it's easy to know that God is all powerful enough to do whatever. I mean, if I were to look at you and if I were to look and, and ask you, is God powerful, powerful enough to do anything he wants to do? Oh, yeah. But if I ask it a different way, are you willing to let God be powerful in your life? That's a whole different question, isn't it? God wants to do something powerful in your life. But you see, what happens to us is that we can't let God be powerful. And the reason we can't, let, let me explain to you this way. There are some of you who have kids over in the children's area. For your pastor's sake and his mental state of mind, thank you that you put your kids in those classes, okay? Because my ADD goes crazy when kids begin to cry. So thank you that you, did, you have done that. But let me tell you, some of you right now, you can't even, you can't even think about enjoying the, uh, lunch because you're thinking, oh my gosh, my kids are going to go to lunch and they're cranky and they're ready for a nap and I don't even want to go to lunch with my kids. You can't, right now, you've already decided you can't enjoy lunch because your kids are going to drive you crazy. And for some of you here right now, you, you know, your, your family has decided because of COVID, we're not going to all get together as extended family and celebrate Christmas. And some of you, you can't even enjoy that because right now you're already thinking, oh my gosh, it's just going to be my spouse or my kids. I want to be with all of my family. You can't even enjoy it. For some of you, you have decided that all of the family is going to get together and you're thinking, I don't want to be with my crazy cousins for Christmas. Because number one, they probably got my name and we're exchanging gifts and they give the worst gifts of anybody. And I'm sure my crazy cousins got my name. As a matter of fact, we all have those crazy cousins. They're arrogant and they think they know everything. And you're going, I don't even want to be with them. And you're, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, why in the world? We are adults. Why are we still exchanging gifts as adults? That's craziness. You can't even enjoy it now because of what's going on. And you see, we forget that God wants you to enjoy in the moment. Why in the moment? So you can enjoy in the future. And if you don't enjoy the moment, that becomes a practice in your life. That you can't enjoy anything in the moment. Therefore, you can't enjoy anything in the future. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, it says this. At that time... <laughs> Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Mary got ready. Do you know why that's rendered in the text? This is crazy here. <laughs> of all the years I've preached on the birth of Christ, I've never known this. She got ready and hurried to a town. You know what the, you know what the picture in the language is right there? The Holy Spirit taking her by the hand and leading her out to be what God's called her to be. So the question is, is that are you allowing the Spirit of God to take you right now to where he wants to take you? This is what God is doing. And you see, here's the difference, folks. Mary has moved from good intentions to good actions. This is what we do as believers. We sit around and we talk about Good intentions. Good intentions has never done anything for anybody. Good intentions has never changed anybody life, anybody's life. And that's what we do as Christ followers. We sit around and we talk about good intentions. They will not change your life. They've never done anything good for anybody at any time for any reason. You think about this. That if my incredible staff, at one time they sit around, and they sat around and talked about it, had good intentions about this crazy notion called the bridge house. Let's start a new 501c3 and let's minister to our neighbors in Lebanon. Let's just do that. Let's just do that. No, they didn't. They went from good intentions to good actions and we opened it up. You came on board and so many of you have given and continue to give and we're going to ask you to continue to give. Why? Because we're moving from good intentions to good actions. That's why. Why did the Bridge House Christmas happen yesterday? Because we went from good intentions to good actions. If all you have is good intentions, you will die with that and never be what God's called you to be. Mary moved from good intentions to good actions. And good intentions mean nothing in your life until you move from good intentions to good actions. We sit around and talk about, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start having a quiet time. I'm going to get in a small group. That's just good intentions. 
No, God moves you to another place. Okay, so then how do I move to good actions? I've got three things I want to give to you as I close. Number one, you do exactly what Mary did and what every great person in Scripture do, did. You allow God to speak to you. You put yourself in position. So you want to move from good intentions to good actions? Then you start the day that I'm going to spend some time alone with God. You allow God to speak to you. Secondly, you allow God to move you. To where? Wherever God wants to move you. Well, give me an example. Well, I can't because everybody's different. It means you've got to trust the Spirit of God in your life. And then the next thing, the third thing is, you do what Mary did. You hurry it off. You take the next step. For some of you, the next step is just to pick up your kids today and enjoy lunch with them and enjoy the moment. Because see, when you start enjoying the moments, God's preparing you for the future that you don't even know about. Why? Because God sees something in you that you do not see in yourself. There were so many people that showed up at the Bridge House Christmas yesterday. Oh my gosh. And our, our daughter, Daria, is our director of operations. We were talking last night and she just began to laugh and she said, you know what? If I would have done what I thought, I would have planned God out of the entire activity. But God was so big yesterday because of you. You moved from good intentions to good actions. But in your personal life, where is it that God wants to move you to? Your heart will never come home. And you'll be normal the rest of your life. And God's never called that for any of us. So you got to ask, okay, am I willing to come home and move through all the uncertainties? Because I'm going to move from intentions to actions. If you're watching online or if you're here in person, for some of you, the next step is you really need to give your heart to Christ. You need to become a follower of this man by the name of Jesus. For a lot of you who are Christ followers, whether you're here watching online, you are a Christ follower, but there's something that you need to just pray today and go, go, say, God, I'm willing to go wherever, wherever you're going to take me. Don't get so uptight. People, you know why people don't pray that? They're afraid that God's going to send them to Africa to do missions. No, it's not that way. God's going to move you in steps. He knows you. He knows how you're wired. He's got you. But trust Him. Let me ask you to bow your heads, would you? Would your heads?